Great. Um, good afternoon and welcome to our last session here at Delta. My name is Carol and I will be your session leader for this afternoon. So we've got a great set of presentations today and I hope you will enjoy them. If you have any questions, great. please. Um, <laughs> please post them in the questions chat and we can get our speakers to answer them at the end. So our first presenter is Russell Mercer. His topic is titled GIS for Small Cities, a Hybrid Approach. Russell is a geographer who is focused on data management. He attended university in Seattle and has spent 20 years in San Diego, I assume, with the last 10 of those as a GIS administrator at the city of Imperial Beach, where he has expanded their GIS using a hybrid of phosphor and Esri technologies. So without further ado, welcome, Russell. Good morning. OK, let's see. Let me start my timer so I know what I'm doing. And we will go. All right, uh, Carol did a really good introduction. Thank you. And uh, good morning, good, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody wherever you might happen to be. Um, it's amazing that we're all able to be on this platform um, everywhere, from wherever in the world. It's, it blows my mind. OK. So we're going to talk about GIS for small cities, uh, a hybrid approach. Um, we're going to talk about what is GIS for small cities. What am I? What am I even mean by that? Uh, where is Imperial Beach? Because that, that is a little bit relevant here. Um, what I have done with GIS in Imperial Beach over the last ten years. What the heck do I mean by a hybrid approach? Uh, Esri, Fos4G. What is that? Um, some keys to success that I've had building a, a program here, and finally. What are what's next? What's on the horizon? Where do I want to go from here? And what am I going to have to change to to get there? Because you know, what I've done to get so far, it's not going to work for the next step. So here we go. So GIS for small cities is mostly uh, to recognize the challenge that small cities face. In that, much the same as large cities, we have all the same departments, we have the same infrastructure. Um, we have utilities in the ground, we've got streets, parks, facilities that have to be maintained. Um, the difference being that generally we're a smaller area, smaller po population, which means that you have less employees, smaller tax base, uh, and, a, and a more limited budget. Um, so those are some potentially pretty major constraints uh, that you have to figure out how to work around. And uh, GIS is no different in that regard, um, dealing with that same limited budget. Um, so what are the solutions to some of these challenges or, or how can we help uh, deal with those? Um, I found this hybrid software approach works really well. Um, you basically look at what's out there and find what works. I've tried not to get tied into a particular platform or, or you know, direction of, of, of where I'm going. It's really evaluating the problem that I need to solve, uh, the people that I need to serve with whatever product I have, uh, looking at what products are available and seeing how I can mix and match and paste and push these things together until uh, add a little magic and see what comes out. Um, and for the most part, it's worked pretty well. Um, we've had pretty good success so far. Uh, the other thing is time versus money. Um, I've had the benefit of being able to put a lot of time into uh, figuring out how to use Postgres and install it and configure it. And uh, the same with some other um, open source technologies, um, as opposed to having the money to basically pay a contractor to get something set up for me. Um, that is not something that I really had the luxury of doing. and. Uh, in the end, I feel like it, it. I've been better for it uh, with the knowledge that I've gained from digging into Postgres and working on the backside of it, um, the configurations and the security and all these uh, other things, and just learning my data inside and out because of uh, Postgres being um, very strict with how it handles data. Um, so that time versus money is, is uh, 
an interesting balance that, that you have to look at. Um, and then kind of on that same uh, thing is, is what do you want to put your money to? Are you going to put it to licensing um, of software to build a GIS? Or are you going to license software that's already built that you can just start using to support your GIS? Um, I've gone the route of trying to bring on applications that will fulfill a need that I already have that I then do not have to develop uh, using basic software that I purchase. So um, we're going to talk about a couple of those uh, uh, major ones um, that you know that we utilize that, that really fulfills that need of, of a, a out of the box application um, built on open source technology um, that I don't then have to uh, put the resources into developing myself because there's no way that I could do it to anywhere near the level that they have. And it's, it's really good. So moving on, where's Imperial Beach? Imperial Beach is the southwesternmost city in the continental United States. So if you see this map, we are right on the US-Mexico border and hence the name right on the beach. Little beach community, about 26,000 people, four and a half square miles, two square miles, all of this developed area that you see under the tile is all developed. Everything else is military and a, a big open space preserve down to the south. Um, and then surrounding us are the city of San Diego and the uh, city of Coronado. So we are very constrained. We're not going to expand anymore. Uh, we're fully built out. Um, and this also feeds into that resource uh, and budget constriction. We don't have any development that we can count on to add new budget uh, or expand our budget. So we really have to be prepared to work within uh, what we already have and make the best use of that uh, as we can. We have about 100 employees, about five departments. So we handle all the major departments. Um, yeah, I've got users, I think, in every department. And there's probably 20 to 25 active users of GIS uh, who use it on a regular basis or interact with spatial data uh, in what they do on a regular basis. So where did we start? I started in public works at uh, the city. Uh, I was hired on as a GIS administrator for the city, but it was in that department. So I was helping with that a lot. In 2011, when I got here, the GIS was uh, what you often think of a GIS uh, in a ton of directories, tons of shape files, tons of copies of shape files, tons of copies of the copies of shape files ad nauseum until you just want to take it all, put it in the trash, and start from scratch. Uh, I had about 10 major layers that I was able to use, and uh, everything has kind of been rebuilt over time. Um, when I started, I implemented an Esri file geo database because that's what I knew. Uh, it was something that I'd worked with and knew how to use and um, was familiar with. And then I used the ArcGIS publisher extension, which feeds uh, configuration files to ArcReader software, which just consumes, um, uh, you know, as pointers to whatever um, data that you have loaded into it, including. Uh, as we'll see later, Postgres um, feeding layers into that software. Um, having implemented the geo database, you immediately run into issues of file locking. Uh, whenever I was editing and somebody opened up our reader to access the software, it put a lock on it so that I couldn't save my edits. Or if somebody was already in it, I then could not open a, a, a layer for editing meaning that I ended up having a working copy and a, uh, uh, I had an editing copy and a production copy and trying to synchronize between the two was uh, a nightmare. In addition, I was in public works, which is up here on the map there. And city hall is down here. It's only a half mile, but uh, 10 years ago, that could have been, you know, you know uh, a thousand miles. Uh, for the distance in bandwidth to get between the two shops. Um, 
there was a huge issue of uh, slow data, uh, slow data connection, being able to move data back and forth. Um, and the file database just, it couldn't handle it. We couldn't handle pushing data across to any large degree. So I needed another solution. Um, so I started looking. I knew uh, after dealing with that for a couple of years and you know needing something different, um, I'd used Postgres a little bit and was aware of it, um, but hadn't installed it or tested it to any large degree. Um, until at one point I was just like, well, let's try it. So I installed it, uploaded our parcel data. The parcel data is managed by the county. It's a huge 500 gigabyte or 500 megabyte file, you know, 300,000 parcels. Um, so it's something that I had loaded in the file G database. So I knew that if anything was gonna test Postgres, it was gonna be that file. Um, it brought it in with no problems, uh, processed it. I was able to load it into ArcMap out of um, from Postgres, uh, PostGIS, and work with it as seamlessly as I was with any of the file geodatabase data. So that was the jumping off point. Um, started my crash course in database management, set, management setting up security and users and uh, automating some of the permissions when you create a new layer and, or a new table or things like that. Um, and, and that kind of continues to this day, uh, you know, figuring things out. Uh, one of the things that I did figure out a while ago that's not an issue now was uh, moving the data from public works to city hall. Uh, I was able to set up the active database replication inside Postgres to where it pushed my edits in the database at Public Works over to uh, City Hall. The way that it does that is in small enough data packets that it wasn't a uh, impact on the bandwidth at all. Um, and that worked seamlessly for, I don't know, a couple of years until they pulled all the data over to City Hall. But once I got it set up, it was basically set it and forget it. And I just knew that it was gonna work, uh, which was a huge, load off my mind and a huge boost in my ability to get data out to people um, in a much more streamlined manner than I could have before. I continued to use Arc Reader, uh, kind of feeding that hybrid approach because it was the best solution that I had at the time uh, to get uh, for viewing and then QGIS for data editing uh, because that wasn't available in ArcMap. Um, for editing in Postgres. So that got me us up to 2017, 2018, started looking for some additional options for data viewing. Um, Arc Reader has a lot of limitations and people wanted a little bit more searchability, um, address, and, you know, uh, address searching and things like that. So I found MapGeo, which is, uh, produced by Applied Geographics in Boston, and it's fully built on an open source stack uh, using, they used to uh, partner with Carto to provide their backend, and now they've implemented uh, their own Carto DB instance uh, to hold their backend data. Um, it works really well, has a lot of flexibility. It was initially just a parcel viewer, but they've expanded it to have many different options uh, for uh, viewing data. And all of these data layers that you see, aside from the base map, are pulling out of that back end, um, which is really handy to be able to use these uh, layers in, in other ways. Um, all of our data is in Postgres now. That's the first thing that I do when I get something is bring it into Postgres. Um, and if somebody needs something, uh, my first option now pretty much is sending it to them as a geo package. Um, I know that Shapefile is proud of its history. If you look at its Twitter, it's extremely proud of its history and rightfully so, but GeoPackage is better. Um, and I'm sure they'll spam me for that, but that's okay. Uh, QGIS is our primary desktop software. Uh, I was doing a lot of mapping in ArcGIS still, but QGIS 3, once that came out, it's just so good um, that it made sense to centralize and do everything in one package. Um, so that's, uh, where we are with uh, 
brings us up to today for our, our data management and, and everything. And now we've had things that have come up that are really pushing the hybrid approach. Uh, we implemented Intergov, which is a planning and permitting and code enforcement software. Um, it's a very complex piece of software, has a lot of mapping uh, on the back end, and they only use Esri, so I needed to support that. Um, it was not going to be feasible for me to stand up an RTS server instance and deal with all of that setup when I only needed it for one product. So I found a contractor to host that for us. Uh, we push data up to them in a geo package. They pull it in um, and then feed that out to be consumed by Intergov and potentially other uh, software that we're going to bring on that also uh, utilizes uh, Esri layers as their as their spatial data feed. Um, we're implementing laser feeds for document management right now. That will be tied to um, uh, MapGeo uh, and our, our spatial data as well, as well as Energov. So from MapGeo, I'll be adding links to be able to jump from a particular parcel that you're looking at or a feature in MapGeo over to Energov if you want to start you know, a, a case of some sort and or laser fish uh, if there is some document management or, or uh, record search that you want to do. Um, I've been looking for a, a, a field data, a data collection platform for a long time. And I managed to find that in uh, input and the merging platform from Lutra. Uh, we've done a little bit of testing and it's just uh, really slick all of the configuration is done in QGIS and then pushes up to up to their uh, cloud and, and out to their apps for uh, for collecting data. And then the next thing that I need to do is implement that more and also implement their um, database connection to where uh, you can push and pull directly from Postgres into their platform, uh, which will make everything a lot better. Um, or streamlined from my perspective, so I'm not having to then translate data some other way. Um, so that's really where we are with the the current system, and these all kind of drove that hybrid approach. You know, um, the staff wanted to use Energov, and it uses an Esri uh, map base, so I needed to support that as the GIS administrator. I wasn't just going to say no, so I needed to find a way to do that, um, and. The best way that I've seen so far is like this, like here, find a little bit of something that I need that's going to serve a purpose, um, pay for that, and push it out uh, instead of standing up RGI server, having to do all the development of that server platform and then build something on top of it to actually be able to do what I need to do. Um, this is much more cost effective and gets me something right now um, that serves everybody's needs very well. So where are the keys to success? Uh, I think I've mentioned this is really looking at what staff and uh, our applications need as far as uh, driving the software choices. Um, city staff needed, well, first, I needed better access to the data that wasn't impacted by editing. That drove the, the leap to Postgres. Um, we needed something better for viewing, uh, more flexibility in searching. That took us to MapGeo. Um, needed to pull in the Intergo software. So then, you know, RGS server. I went that way and bringing up little pieces and adding them on and making sure that they all work together, sitting on top of Postgres, which has saved me so much time um, because it just works. You know, I have it installed. I've got it set up to work with and be able to push data out if I need it. Um, and, you know, I'm always kind of looking at things to reevaluate if I need to um, and then move on from there. But paying for front end applications, not paying for a big software stack that I have to do development on has saved me thousands of dollars and thousands of hours of development time that I don't have and let me focus on the data 
and the applications for people um, and getting them what they need instead of building the application. So where are we going from here? Um, uh, our GIS website is on uh, Amazon. We now have an on-premise web server, which we didn't before. So I'm gonna be moving that to our on-premise server, implementing map server or geo server to uh, serve spatial data. I wanna build a custom base map for our city. Uh, we've got some really good aerials and other data that I wanna uh, get out there, give some downloads for data and maps directly from the website expand map geo it's got a lot of flexibility that i'm not utilizing all the way and then automation uh, do as much as i can to take me out of the process uh, i'm already being pulled about five different ways uh, and if i could clone me i would about four different times but until then i'm going to automate the heck out of things so that everything happens uh, and i'm not the bottleneck anymore i think that's all we've got any questions Again, I'm Russell Mercer, City of Imperial Beach. There's my email. I'm on Twitter at Get Spatial. Try to hang out on the GIS chat every Wednesday at uh, noon Pacific time. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Russell, for your uh, talk. I think we've discussed how um, relevant and interesting the work that you're doing is. Um, we do have a couple of questions. So the first question, if you're ready, <laughs> Um, how many data editors do you have at your city? Do you ever do multi-user editing and how do you manage that? Uh, right now, I am a GIS department of one and I've not been uh, open to letting other people edit, mostly because I've not had a good solution for handling it. Um, I know that there was a, I think that there were a couple of talks at this conference that we're talking about um, versioning and, and some multi-user editing and tracking stuff. So I need to look at those because that's something that I wanna put in place um, to allow other people to have more control and, and authority over, over their data. So some of the sewer staff can work on their data and other people can update things against so that I don't have to, I'm definitely the bottleneck and I need to get myself out of that. So. Um, Right now, I'm not managing it. <laughs> it's just me. Oh, that's um, okay. There's another question. Um, was it easy to change from proprietary software, or was it dependent on contractors to FOSS slash self-reliance? Any advice to your younger self? I think my advice to my younger self probably would have been to jump on this sooner than I did. I mean, I dealt with that file geo database for a couple of years before uh, I started with Postgres and I should have just bit the bullet and done it before because it, it would have um, made it a lot easier before then. Um, there wasn't really a problem to change. Uh, when I came, when I started at the city, there was no infrastructure. Uh, I was brought on to build the GIS essentially from scratch because they knew that they didn't have anything. So. I wasn't, there was nothing that was locked in. Uh, so it wasn't a problem to um, kind of shift gears midstream, as long as what I was doing didn't impact what uh, any of my users ability to get to their data. And they generally didn't unless I uh, took down the database trying to back it up or upgrade it or something, which may have happened a couple of times. They're very forgiving. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. I'm just gonna like bombard you with questions because they're just like <laughs> coming down. <laughs> it's raining. <laughs> um, right, you're moving from the cloud back to on-premise. What's the main motivation for this move? Um, so, and, and this is probably my lack of knowledge more than anything else is um, configuring in Amazon. Uh, you know, you've got your your static data store, but if you've got your database, uh, if you want a database, it's over here. And if you want to push those together and serve it out, it, there's a security layer involved. And that's a lot of configuration that, as I started reading into it, was not very straightforward. Um, when we've got uh, IT staff at the city who are very 
much more competent than I am in um, many things. And they will be able to handle the security and I'll make sure that I don't uh, make them mad um, by doing something bad, uh, which we work very well together. So um, that's not been a problem. Um, but really that's my motivation is, is uh, having it close to where it's a lot easier for me to work with it. And, you know, if I need to restart it or add something else, um, it's also much cheaper. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, there was a convenience factor to paying for Amazon um, that, that worked while it did. But now that we have a, a web server on, you know, at the city, uh, there's no reason not to use it. it. It's, you know, on a new software, uh, hardware appliance. It's got a ton of space um, and and a lot of uh, processing capacity behind it. So uh, that was that was my main uh, reason for it. Okay. Um, next one. Do you perform edits on the parcel data using open source software? Chief kind of answered already. Uh, if so, how do you maintain topology? Actually, our parcel data is maintained by the county. Uh, so I download um, that on a regular basis from the county website. Uh, they do all the parcel edits in um, conjunction with the uh, county assessor's office. So they're doing any splits and, and um, edge matching and, and anything. So fortunately, I don't have to deal with topology. Um, if I did, I would be implementing some topology functionality that's in Postgres uh, or PostGIS, I would imagine, um, to, to ensure that it was validated. Great. So many questions. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and um, we'll try and attack as many as we can. Um, how long did self, how long did long serving staff respond to the switch from all Esri to learning new tools? Uh, they didn't really know the difference. I mean, before I started, they didn't have, there was a, um, there was a web, there was a, a map viewer that was tied to some old database software with the city that was terrible. So when I rolled out Arc Reader, um, everybody was like, wow, something that actually works. And then uh, when I rolled out Map Geo, I had, I was testing it with, staff before uh, we brought it on and they were really excited about it so i had buy-in from the get-go um mm -hmm. uh, before i switched over so it really and and there's actually people still using arc reader because they don't need map geo they're always in the office and things like that so uh, it's been a, a pretty easy switch uh, and i've had people use um qgis to do some uh to do some maps and some basic database functionality and some stuff like that um I've even had people using PG admin to go in and run their own queries and, uh, you know, on the database for some um, uh, planning and some permitting and stuff um, where I, I was able to pull the data in uh, from our old system and it's easier to query it uh, in PG admin. So um, really it, it's been, it's been pretty well, um, very smooth. I, I've had very little resistance. Um, mostly because everything that I've put in place, I think I've really tried to make sure that it's significantly better than what they had before. Um, so it, there was a good incentive to move. Okay, maybe the last one. Um, there is a debate on the chat. So if you wanna join that later, <laughs> I invite you to join the chat. Um, the last one is kind of a, a bit of a compliment, I assume. Uh, are you a unicorn or are there many small US cities that follow a similar approach? Uh, unfortunately, I think I am a unicorn, which is why I keep doing these presentations to show people that it's possible. It's not like, it's not difficult. I mean, we all can figure out how to use the software. We all can figure out how to install it and configure it and get data out to people. And then if you let other people do the main development on applications, then I don't have to be the programmer making it look good other people do that i just make sure that the data is good um but i, I wish i wasn't as rare as i was I, i'm the only open source shop in in san diego um it's definitely a 
interesting feeling when I go to uh, our our original uh, workshops or our original user group meetings, and I'm like, "Is there any open source in that, or what? What about this?" They're like, "Esri, no." Anyway, no, it's a <laughs> yeah. So I'm definitely a unicorn. Uh, I just took off my took off my horn for a while. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for your presentation, Russell, and for answering all these questions. Sorry to bombard you. Um, but I think if anybody has any questions, they probably can pull out your contact details from this presentation or find you maybe in the uh, social gathering room. <laughs> so it's good yes. having you here. Yeah, and, um, and like, I said, I'm, uh, like I said, I'm on Twitter at, at Get Spatial. Um, and, uh, hanging around in the GIS chat whenever I remember that it's going on Wednesdays. So. Perfect. Thank you so much, Russell, for joining us and hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. All right. Thank you so much. Take care.